So, Biliana, we're here this morning on, well, we're in Darwin, but for the people who don't know, this is beautiful Larrakia land. And I know that you're a visitor to this land, just like I am. And I think we both every day feel so incredibly grateful that we get to live on such a beautiful, beautiful land. I remember when I first arrived here, I said, this place has got something about it. And this woman said to me, well, that's because we, we sing to the land. We sing to the land and therefore it's, it's so beautiful and it has, it has a spirit about it. Mm. So I just want to acknowledge the people of this land and thank them for allowing us to live here mm. with them and learn from them. So, well, you, it's interesting you mentioned um, I'm a visitor to this land. It's, it's very true. My um, ancestral line through my mother is the Torres Strait Islands. So some people would consider me to be an indigenous immigrant of sorts. Um, and it's great that we do acknowledge the fact that we are on Larrakia lands. And many people often ask, well, what is the difference between an acknowledgement and a welcome? What are some of the historical protocols and practice, practices that distinguishes one from the other? Why is acknowledgement? Who can do it? Why is a welcome important? How? Where's that come from? Well, I'd, I'd like to throw out um, a, a collective sense of humanity. Imagine that you are sitting in a sacred space, your safe place, a space where you sing to and somebody knocks at your door. Then it's very important that when you approach the knock at your door, that the people before they come in state their intent. So bring it back to 1788, there was no statement of intent. When there was a knock on the door at Sydney Cove by the British settlers slash invaders, depending on which way you wish to frame it, there was no statement of intent. There was a knock at the door. The door was opened. The door was opened to a point where people who were sick, torn, troubled, were given fresh water, was given food, was given medicine to help with their wounds, to help heal their spirits, help, help heal their bodies. In return, the people who knocked upon our doors and entered our homes did not leave. They chose to stay and cause their own particular form of party in, in our homes. So when we acknowledge that we are on Larrakia lands, we are visitors. We are sitting inside somebody else's sacred place. We are sitting inside their home, their home of 30, 40, 50,000 years. We are sitting in their home. So I think it's really important that we, we state our intent. We want to look, we want to listen, we want to learn. We want to be sung by the land which is sung by thousands of years by indigenous peoples of this particular land. Now the language is really important. Um, if I can be a bit of a wordsmith for a moment. Language, L-A-N-G-U-A-G-E. -A -A if you put the letter D in the middle of the word language, you get the double whammy word land gauge. So a person's language is a way to gauge the land that you're on. Now historically, if I am of another country, of another space and a place, I need to seek permission to speak a foreign language on somebody else's land. If I can build upon the auntie that you met who said we sing the land, could you imagine the frequency, the singing, the stamping of the ground in corroboree, the sound of children laughing, the sounds of their senior people sharing stories with their, with their, with their grandchildren. All of the birds 
would hear and be affected by that frequency called the land. Everything that walks upon the land would be affected by the frequency of the singing of the birds that are in the trees. Everything that is of the land has a frequency. So to speak a language that is not of this particular land, it's almost like we have to seek permission or to seek the acknowledgement that I'm speaking somebody else's frequency upon the land that has been sung for 40, 50,000 years. This then created a great deal of destabilization, fracturedness, when men were removed from their community and their ability to serve their families, when women were taken away from their children and their children were forcibly removed from the arms of their mothers and their language was taken away. For when language is taken away, you lose that connection between mother and child where the child held the sounds, the frequency, the space and the place of their mother's birthplace, their womb, that frequency, that sacred place. So when you have that removal from language, you create a sense of trauma and fracturedness that helps us understand why we as Indigenous First Nations people are so overrepresented in mental health institutions, in drug and alcohol detoxification clinics, in, 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 in places and spaces where are less than healthy. Because of a trauma. And it doesn't matter if you're indigenous, if you are of that culture, of this land, of that country, we are all humans first. So to acknowledge country is to recognize that we are in somebody else's sacred place. To welcome to country is somebody who is of that home, of that sacred place, who comes to the door and says, you wish to come into my sacred place. You wish to come into my sovereign domain. What is your intent? Mm. Do you wish to look, listen, learn, to share culture? Do you want to take my, my children away? Do you want to remove my mothers and my language? Do you want to take my senior people away? What is your intent? Mm. And if your intent is pure and accepted by the person who, who is the custodian of that sacred place, welcome. Come in, look, listen, learn wine, dine, dance, romance each other's, let us learn each other's ways through our diversity, through the space and the place which collects us as humans, as people. So I'm really glad that you've acknowledged the fact that we are together on Indigenous lands of the Larrakia people. And Biliana, you're a teacher on this land mm -hmm. and you teach young people every day and I've always thought to myself my goodness this man must be an incredible teacher I actually had a dream about you teaching me if you remember <laughs> I don't do. um, so tell me a little bit how that ties in um, to your to, to your life's work and your beliefs and your faith when I was much younger my my, my my parents and the friends by my parents thought one day he's going to be an actor. Mm. One day we, we see him on stage. He's got a lot of energy and a lot of talent. And with a bit of focus, focusedness, we may one day see him on stage and we may one day hear his voice being raised in great assemblies. Mm. I never made it on stage because I couldn't remember my lines. <laughs> But I could remember my equations and my formulas. Mm. So I knew I had a propensity, a natural inherent gift for recognizing the patterns in numbers. And I remember not so long ago, I asking students, 
For you, students, John, what, what makes a good teacher? And I remember Johnny looking up and saying, you know what, mister, you're a good teacher. Oh, why am I good to teach it? And he says, because you like to be here. And I think if there's a sense of belonging in your spirit, a sense of wholesomeness in your heart, a want, a wish, a desire to deliver that which you are naturally born with, that which you have as a gift, and offer this to humanity in the most humblest, fun way, then there's a level of integrity that we all should strive for. So being in the classroom, I feel like I am that unemployed actor. This is my stage, this is my audience, this is what we will do. The other thing I remember being, being a young man was that my parents, who are Baha'is, and I share that faith, spoke very clearly of a thing called progressive revelation. And it sort of boils down to this, as best I can elucidate and understand. All the great manifestations were perfect mirrors that reflected the one creator. And the manifestations of that one creator is, is, is every tree that dances in the breeze, every bird that sings upon its branch, every wave that floats from land to land, every flower that is born from the same flower bed. They all mirror the same creator but they come at different times. Firstly, to re-remind humanity about the love that the Creator has for all humanity, a re-reminder. And the second thing they bring are laws, ordinances, practices, principles that are necessary and required for that particular point in time. So for example, um, there was a quote from Christ when he spoke of Moses, when he said, Think not that I've come to destroy the teachings of Moses, nay, rather I've come to fulfill them. So there's a progression. There's a time when the people who are the followers of Moses practiced a certain thing within society and then moved on to learn to practice other things. So Christ then spoke of things like, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. After Christ came Muhammad, who was a seal of the prophets. And after Muhammad came our blessed Baha'u'llah, who opened up a new, the dawn of a new era, but also was a perfect mirror that reflected the light of the same Creator also re-reminded humanity about the love that our one creator has for all of us as people. And also laid down laws and audiences that are particular to this point in time. Now one might say, well, <laughs> what does that have to do with that classroom and mathematics and being <laughs> an unemployed actor? You might say, I did well in maths. I finished my high school and I went to my teacher, Mr. Betts, and with a single solitary tear in my eye, I said, Mr. Betts, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You have, you have helped me achieve such blessedness when it came to the world of numbers. And he looked at me and put a hand on my shoulder and he said, I haven't given you anything that wasn't already there. Through our time together, we have blossomed and bloomed that which was the seed in the fertile soil of your heart and your natural capacity for numbers. So that gave me the appreciation that my ability to do calculus multivariable integration, multivariable differentiation came from the fact that I had a first grade teacher who said, see these symbols? They're called numbers. 
and we could operate these numbers using four symbols called plus, minus, times and divide. Once we grasp that, the fundamentals, the foundations, we can then grow, blossom and bloom into our fullest potential at that particular point in time. And if we imagine ourselves into that trajectory, we will continue to hit that exponential and grow into things that are totally unimaginable. So I can only accept, really understand the practices and principles that have been revealed by Baha'u'llah because of what happened with humanity back in the time when we followed Zoroastra, when we moved into the teachings of the Buddha, moved into the world of Christianity through Christ, moved into our Islamic sisters and brothers founded by Muhammad and then by Baha'u'llah. My last point. Our mother, who was born in the Torres Strait Islands, had an anglicised, Anglo-oriented man, beautiful man from England, and a beautiful woman from the Torres Strait. Because mum was born brown of skin, and because her mother had passed away by a very treatable disease called tuberculosis, the government had a policy by which children of that situation would be taken, removed, relocated, dare I say stolen, from family, from culture, and relocated in another part of the world called a Catholic convent for girls. She was raised just off here by a group of nuns. Mum has related stories that are of the ilk of unimaginable horrors and no child, no child should ever be exposed to such compromisation from the priests and the nuns. Still, Mum did not know anything different. When we were teenagers, we got into a lot of trouble in school because of colour. We would go back to mum and dad, particularly mum, and say, what does this mean? What does this colour mean? Why are we so marginalised because of this level of pigmentation? Mum, with tears in her eyes, would say, I cannot give you language, song and dance. I can quote whatever you like from the New Testament and the Bible. That was my socialization. That was my acculturation. Soon after, we then moved back to the Torres Strait and we swam in culture. We immersed ourselves in family. We felt a sense of strength, inner strength, that we felt enamoured by which we could then protect ourselves from the slings and arrows of other people's ignorance. The Baha'i Faith. Mum, for many years, said, Baha'u'llah, progressive revelation, to be a Baha'i, but Christ is the Saviour. That's all I know. But dad would say, okay, but in the time, you will know and understand that to become a Baha'i, you cannot reject Christ. Mum, mm. mm. in a lucid dream, moved from the convent. The nuns were waving at the door. <clears throat> Mum would walk down the path and she came across this illuminated, glorious illumination of the nine-pointed star. And mum in her heart of hearts knew that in order to become a Baha'i, she could not reject Christ. Mm. And from that moment on, she understood fully progressive revelation. She became a Baha'i. She found it in her heart of hearts to, to forgive, to understand, but never forget the atrocities that were heaped upon her as a, as, a, as a teenager, and not just her, but so many other people. 
and the importance of the acculturation of culture, whatever it might be. If you are East Indian, if you are Timorese, if you are Thai, swim in culture while we embrace a global world. That's beautiful. So the theme of this year's NIDOC week is get up, stand up, show up. And I know that a lot of Australians are horrified and in pain over what has occurred in the past and wish to do something to live up to that request of this theme of NIDOC week, but maybe don't know quite what to do. Um, aren't as lucky as I am to have somebody like you in my life that, you know, can come and have a chat and kind of learn from. Um, so what would you, what would you say to them if they came and asked you, you know, what, what can I, what can I do? It's really interesting how the screen and TV has the effect of to anaesthetise, mm. to almost caramelise. When we want to get up, stand up, show up, mm. one of the things we have to do is extract ourselves from the screen, move ourselves away from technology, and move ourselves closer to our hard wiring of each other, where we are sensory creatures, we are social animals, we're meant to touch and be touched, we're meant to swim up into the nape of each other's necks, we are meant to hug and be held, we are not meant to hit, hurt and harm. So get up, get out of the, get off the lounge. <laughs> Literally, yes. the number of people who are watching back-to-back -back Netflix and Stan is insane. And the age group is getting younger and younger and younger. And it's not just watching a 90-minute movie. It's watching a nine-day series. Get up off the couch. Stand up, put some weight on your feet. Bend your knees walk out through that front door and move into a world that is hungry for more people. Find like-minded people who are activated, who are aware, who bicycle, who walk, who swim, who kick a ball, throw a ball, throw a frisbee. Get up. The next part is you mentioned before about the number of people who want to write the social ills, the past injustices. There are an increasing number of organisations and groups that are moving along this vein. Join them. Be part of that movement. Get up. Show up. Be part of that movement. I might make mention of the Multicultural Society, the Council, Northern Territory, based in Malak. They have a newsletter. They post all these activities of unity and diversity, multiculturalism, people who are not watching TV, people who are not in their lounge rooms, people who are hanging out with like-minded people to actually be the force of change. It blew me away. Do you know tomorrow night? <laughs> no, tonight, today's Saturday. It's the Festival of Kindness. Yes. <laughs> Can you believe that? I mean, okay, we probably need more of it, but we can't have enough of it. But we've got a festival of kindness. While there's so much controversy in the world, people are hungry for those things, for kindness. Mm. NADOC week. Find those organisations, align yourself to those organisations. And if you cannot find that organisation, start one for yourself and bring in our like-minded people. Mm. But really, get away from the screen. 
look upwards and outwards sometimes downwards and inwards okay okay we've got to check our emails <laughs> but it's nice to look upwards and outwards sometimes too and drop into that hard wiring of us as people we're social animals we're sensory creatures we're not meant to live in isolation and be fed by technology mm. we're meant to hug and be hugged and swim up into the napes of each other's necks and smell each other's company and run sing and dance and just be stupid with each other sometimes no speciality being stupid speciality. <laughs> 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 yeah, and you started your own thing, I think it was probably about a year ago now, that you started Ocean Devotion. Oh, yeah. Will you tell me a little bit about that? <sighs> In this very, very busy world, it's hard to find time. Mm. So I got, to my, I got to this point where I thought, you know, early morning, just before dawn, the only competing agenda is sleep. Mm. So if we're able to tell our body, discipline our body, and say, I know you want to sleep in. I know it's nice delving deep under this doona, but uh, we're going to get up. And we're going to rise with the sun. We're going to go in the transition where dark becomes light, which is a very deep, profound metaphor. When we move from a space of lack of awareness, where there's not a lot of light, to a space and a place where we go through that transition, there's a dawning, a rising of the spirit, a level of awareness that moves from a little bit of ignorance to increased awareness. So I thought, hmm, ocean devotion, but at dawn, just before dawn, and be part of the rising. The rising of spirit in our bodies as individuals, the rising of the spirit as a collective, the rising of spirit as humanity, can be created by oceans of devotions. Now, because we're living on places like this, mm -hmm. the rolling of the waves, the birds that sing in the trees, that is the language of the land. Going full circle to the beginning of our conversation where we would sing the land mm. as the land would sing to us. There's a symphony of sounds that come from outside to the inside. There's a sound that comes from deep from within, that comes from the inside to the outside. So, Oceans of Devotion is where we come together, we share each other's readings, thoughts, feelings. Doesn't matter the age, doesn't matter what religious background you may have, doesn't matter what thought or belief system you might live by, all are welcome. And what's so interesting is that it's grew to a nice manageable group. A little more, maybe. A little less, maybe. But it's got to a, a, a number and with this high quality. Mm. People have walked past, people have bicycled past and said, oh, 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 Biliano, I saw you Sunday morning mm. with your friends. You were there again. Mm. Yes, because this is with us yet again. If we were living in Central Australia, surrounded by sand dunes, it would be just as special. If we were sitting on a fallen log, surrounded by a rainforest of trees, how special would that be? So wherever we are, whatever we do, move away from the TV, put weight on our feet, walk through the door and just move and things will come to you. Just to bring this home, I don't know if you've seen a, an old cartoon called Ludwig. Uh, Ludwig he, there's a, there's a, a very sad fellow, he, he's, a, he's a character. And anyway, he's sitting there and there's a TV 
and there's a beautiful sunset. He's sitting there in his couch, looking at the TV on this beautiful sunset. But guess what is just happening outside his window? The same sunset. So I think that's what drives the message home for me. And I have noticed that when you are out in nature, and you refer to the Cathedral of the Sky and, you know, I mean, I can see you radiate joy when you're outdoors. It, it seems to really fill you, fill you up. Do you think that's something that's innately with, in you? Do you think that that's something that has, was really strengthened by that time in the Torres Strait Islands? Like, where do you think that, that stems from for you? Okay, um... I was definitely getting a bit lost in the world. I had a lot of energy but didn't know where to guide it so it became misguided. Too much time on my hands and not being fairly selective about what I chose to do in my day and who I chose to do it with. I was falling into an abyss of Drugs, disdain, despondency. I was becoming very lazy, lethargic, lackadaisical, and very lost. Both in my world and outside my world. I heard about this thing called um, Vipassana. Um, it's, a, it's a form of um, meditation founded by Buddha. And it's 10 days, complete silence, no talking. Friends of mine said, we love you, we care for you. You need to get out of this space. You need to burst the bubble and just sit in silence for a while. In a community of people who also sit in silence. Went up to Noosa. There are 120 people like myself who found themselves in the lotus position, the, the Buddha position, as best they could. And for the next 10 days, for 24 hours a day, would not go out, but would go deep within. It was then that I started to realise the power of silence, the strength of stillness. So wherever we are and whatever we do, be it in the forest, the desert, the land, the sea, a plane, a car, in front of a, a camera, sitting on a stool on a cliff, one must never underestimate the knowledge that is gained through silence and the strength, power and integrity that comes through stillness, particularly when it is shared not just with other people but with other kingdoms of the same creator, mm -hmm. the vegetable kingdom, the animal kingdom. When we sit in silence, strength and solidarity, stillness with that, we realised we're not alone. Mm -hmm. We are never alone. And there's so much love in the world that sometimes we forget to plug ourselves back in. That story with Christ where there were Christ and this person was walking on the beach and there were two sets of footprints and suddenly in storm and tempest there was only one set of footprints mm -hmm. and the person said, oh, 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 Christ, you left me. And Christ said, no, 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 no. They are my footprints because that's where I carried you. Yeah, that story Do you remember gets that? me. I, every Do you remember time, that? that gets me. Do you remember yes. that? Do you remember that? <laughs> and there's, there's, there's hidden words from Baha'u'llah that mm. talks about, I have never left you. Mm. You've just turn your head a little bit 30 degrees and you'll find me sitting on your shoulder and walking alongside you mm. and at times part of our human experience part of our journey of being here we get a little lost 
<laughs> we get a little misguided. Mm -hmm. We might start running around with a group of uh, people that may be not so good for us at that point in time. Mm -hmm. But I say again, find your place of quietness. Mm -hmm. Sit in silence and in take the strength and integrity that comes with stillness. And we will realize that we are far from alone. One of the things that I've read in the last few years, which really just stuck with me, resonated with me, was um, a woman, she's actually a permaculturalist, but she was talking about the state of the world and the state of the environment. And she said, I have made a conscious decision that I'm going to choose radical optimism mm -hmm. because that is the only thing that I think is yes. going to make a difference. Yes. A, a difference in the world yes. is radical optimism in the face of whatever may come. Yes. And I do think you're the epitome, <laughs> Biliana, <laughs> of radical optimism. Every time I'm not feeling radically optimistic, I just should really visualize you and then I'll be like, oh yeah, that's how you do it. So. How do you remain so optimistic and so positive and um, with so much joy every day? You come into the world every day with such joy. How do you, how do, you do that? Choose who you run with. <laughs> Choose who you'd be with. Mm. If I imagine um, the physical body, my mm -hmm. physical realm, I was putting sugar, too much sugar in my cup of tea. Mm -hmm. And a friend looked at me and says, whoa, you are putting way too much sugar in your tea. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, and he looked at me and says, how much is your body worth? Uh, 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 uh. Well, I tell you what, if, you, if I gave you a Ferrari, half a million dollars, $500,000, I gave you a Ferrari, would you put a cup of sugar in the petrol tank? Mm -hmm. Uh, no, no, it would <laughs> seize up the Ferrari. Your body, in all its beauty, in mm. all its manifestation of the one same creator, needs to be fed and fueled in a positive way, an empowering way, a healthy way. And then I went, yep, 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 okay. So I, I went from three teaspoons of sugar to half a teaspoon after a while. But, and then he said, and it's not just your body. Mm. Our bodies are multi-dimensional. You have your spiritual form. Pray, meditate, sit in silence, be quiet, feel the stillness, feed the spiritual form like you would your physical form. Your emotions, do you want to Fill your emotions with toxicity, negativity. Will that help you fly? Will it put wind under your wings? Or will it allow your emotions to be free of your body and embrace the virtue of, of separation, of not being too attached to anything, not being too Velcro with it? So the emotions, the mind, the body, the spirit. So. I think if we are, if move into conscious awareness from the dark light to the night daylight and we start to feed mind, body, spirit, emotions with really healthy food mm. and sustain that, we will always wake up happy. Mm. Years ago, a person said, radical optimism, I've heard that expression before, and he described it as being stepping off a five-storey building and knowing that you will fly. Mm. Mm. And as you're going down, you smile and still say, so far so good. <laughs> so far so good. And if you're still falling, after an extended period of time, guess what you start to feel? I haven't hit ground yet. I haven't hit ground. My God, I'm not falling at all. Mm. I'm flying. Mm. When we approach every person, place, situation 
with that radical optimism, mm. we will always approach it with a smile. I know in this point in time, we're, having a, we're in the midst of a, a big family situation, gonna have to fly back to Lismore. It's really unhealthy. It involves a very close member of our family. Radical optimism is, is the call of the day. She doesn't want people to be sick, sad around her. She wants us to do for her that which she cannot have if she wings her way. And that's the power of touch. Mm. To hold one's hand, to hear their voice, to smell their presence, to embark upon that now is so exceedingly important. But we must approach that, like you said before, your friend, radical optimism. Mm. It's what we need. Mm. Mm. Billiana, this has been amazing. Is there anything else you'd like to share with anybody, that, with the people that are watching? The amount of energy, if I were to take a scientific paradigm on it, the, 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 the scientific methodology says that energy cannot be created or destroyed, merely transferred. Some scientists use the word transformed. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, merely transferred, transformed. So my humble suggestion and quiet invitation to anybody and everybody who might come across this. Take that energy and choose the hand that helps, not hits. The arms that hug and hold, not the arms that crush. The words that lift, and give that person the level of inner confidence and assuredness that they will fly. Do not use the words to diminish, to dilute, to put them in the corner. The greatest gift that Eve gave Adam was the gift of choice. Choose this apple and maintain the Garden of Eden. Choose this hand that caresses not hurts. Choose the arms that hold, not crush. Choose the words that sing a lullaby, not diminish and dilute. So every bit of war in the world, every bit of conflict, whether it be this big, this big, or this big inside, make the conscious aware choice to use that energy to reframe, reflip, and just turn it all around. My message. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing.